It's hard to believe that the Assassin's Creed series is officially 15 years old. Since 2007, these games have transported players across the globe, across time, and have presented all of us with unforgettable action-adventure stealth gameplay. There have been highs, and there have been lows, amongst reinventions, expansions, and a number of spin-offs and mobile games. So, in honor of its crystal anniversary, we're taking a clear and close look at the games of Assassin's Creed past, present, and infinite future. The 15-year-old franchise we know today didn't begin as Assassin's Creed. After the release of 2003's Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Patrice Desilet was made the creative director of the next Prince of Persia game. As more and more technical information about the next generation of consoles was coming out, the Ubisoft Montreal team decided to take the game to a whole new level, open world. And as the gameplay began to take on a major change, so did the titular character. Alex Drowen, animation director for Altair, said in an interview with Polygon, I remember Desilet was saying a lot. What is a prince other than someone that is waiting to be king? So what could be better than a prince? A kick-ass, ass, ass in? At that point, Prince of Persia, Assassin, featured an assassin as the main character, who was tasked with rescuing and escorting an AI prince. But as the game evolved more and more, the prince was dropped, and the creed adopted. In order to make a fulfilling, realistic game that puts you into the shoes of an assassin, Desilet and his team had to execute two elements seamlessly, cities and crowds. The physical setting of Assassin's Creed needed to feel historical and authentic, as well as explorable. The harmonious marriage of gameplay and design was critical for the game to survive. The ability to climb, jump, dash, and descend across buildings, rooftops, and iconic structures. Parkour! 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 And the city streets would need to feature advanced AI crowds that would react, move, and would be impacted by the actions of the player. These elements, combined with a compelling story, combat, and characters, gave way for the first of many games to come. Assassin's Creed. 2007 was an outstanding year for games. Assassin's Creed released alongside Mass Effect, Portal, Uncharted Drake's Fortune, Team Fortress 2, and of course, B-movie game. The game introduced players to Altair, a member of the Assassin Brotherhood in the Holy Land around 1191, during the time of the Third Crusade. After a mission goes wrong, Altair is left disgraced and must rebuild his status in the Brotherhood by assassinating key Templar figures. All the while, Desmond Miles, Altair's great, 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 great grandson, relives the memories of his ancestor through a machine called the Animus in order to uncover the secrets of the MacGuffin, aka the Apple of Eden. The developers behind the game had utilized the performance of next-gen consoles to their advantage. Assassin's Creed looked great for 2007. On the surface, it would later be revealed that certain models were horrifically warped in order to achieve desired designs. Malik's missing arm was scrunched up into his body, and oh, you thought those were custom horse models? Oh my sweet summer child, you're looking at hooked and hunched human models with a horse skin on top. <laughs> Move over, Cronenberg. There's a new body horror master in town. The gameplay was fluid enough that it felt good to blend in with the crowd, scale buildings, climb atop towers, and of course, dive into one of Jerusalem's many convenient carts of hay. Sure, some quests could often feel repetitive, and look, the Desmond storyline was just okay, which would become a staple of the series. Look, I don't want to stress about the world is ending and that's why I got to use DNA to travel back in time to solve puzzles as an assassin. I just want to run around with historical figures, climb shit, and do some super cool stealth kills. Pew, 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 pew. But soon after release, Assassin's Creed quickly racked up sales and positive reviews, including a 5 out of 5 from X-Play, which meant it was time to make more. One year later, Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles was released. The game was a prequel adventure to Assassin's Creed, developed by Gameloft Bucharest, and released initially on the Nintendo DS, and later on mobile devices. 
In it, the player takes control of Altair one year before the events of Assassin's Creed on a mission to find the Chalice, a powerful artifact that could ultimately guarantee victory in the Crusades to whoever found it. And so with great power comes great responsibility to make sure that the great power doesn't get into the wrong hands. The game itself was a side-scrolling platformer adventure where players would manipulate Altair into solving environmental puzzles, breaking pottery Zelda style, and fighting snake traps with a big sword or an inconvenient adjacent box. For a spin-off, it was just… fine. The plot was basic, hell, even Altair's characterization was not terribly memorable, but if you were looking for something that was going to give you the same feeling that roaming the open world of Assassin's Creed on the PS3 or Xbox 360 did, well, you were up the Barada without a paddle. But Altair's spin-off games didn't stop there. 2009 would see the release of Assassin's Creed Bloodlines, a PSP game developed by Griptonite Games that actually did return players to the action-adventure open-world environment of the first game. Unlike Altair's Chronicles, Bloodlines takes place after the original Assassin's Creed, with Altair arriving in Cyprus hot on the trail of Templars trying to escape. But that's not the only thing keeping Altair hot. Maria Thorpe, a Templar agent he spared in the first game and whom Altair would eventually marry, played a significant role in Bloodlines. It's a tale as old as time. Boy meets girl. Girl's an agent of your mortal enemy. Boy spares girl. Girl escapes. Boy finds girl again. Girl eventually helps boy. Boy chases girl on the rooftops. Boy and girl go for a romp in the once again conveniently placed hay. You get the picture. The setting of Cyprus was also a familiar one to the developers. One of the initial PS2 demos of Assassin's Creed centered around missions in Cyprus, which were eventually scrapped as the main game progressed. Ultimately, Bloodlines' quality did not match that of its predecessors and instead featured rough visuals with clipping animation, basic buildings, and lackluster combat. The game would also be released in November of 2009, right alongside the next major installment of the Assassin's Creed series. Assassin's Creed 2 released in November of 2009 onto the PS3 and Xbox 360 and was an immediate improvement on its predecessor. The series jumped forward in time and placed players inside the lavish and evolving world of the Italian Renaissance. And most importantly, the game introduced the world to Ezio Auditore da Firenze a playboy turned assassin when tragedy strikes his family. And yes, Desmond and his modern-day ass is still here too. As Ezio, players had free roam of several open-world Italian cities, including Venice and Florence and more. On top of improving features from the first title, Assassin's Creed 2 also introduced several new elements like the ability to interact more with crowds and NPCs, including throwing money on the ground and throwing money at people to do your bidding. Gone was the never-ending daylight of Altair's adventures. Assassin's Creed 2 introduced day and night cycles with missions and events being tied to specific times of day. More weapons, more combat abilities, more historical figures. Assassin's Creed walked so that Assassin's Creed 2 could fly in Leonardo da Vinci's own flying machine, of course. Assassin's Creed Bloodlines and Assassin's Creed 2 weren't the only Assassin's Creed games to release November of 2009. Another title, Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery, was released as well, which is a total of three games from one franchise releasing all in the same day. Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery was another spin-off title developed by Griptonite Games and released on the Nintendo DS. The game was essentially a companion to Assassin's Creed 2, taking place between sequences 12 and 13 in the main game. Ezio is tasked with traveling to Spain not only to investigate the missing Spanish assassin brotherhood, but because someone is going to assassinate Christopher Columbus. Which in the long run may not have been such a bad idea as the game makes it out to be. The title was a vast improvement on the previous Assassin's Creed DS title. Gameplay felt fluid. The story was compelling. Sure, it was easy for missions and segments to feel repetitive, but Discovery delivered a satisfying paired experience with Assassin's Creed 2. Like a fig jam and a nice camembert. Mwah! Ubisoft continued to ride the Ezio train with 2010's Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. While it was the third major installment for the series, it did not bear the moniker 3 in its name since the game was a direct sequel to Assassin's Creed 2 and still featured our main boy, Ezio. 
Ezio, now with a sweet goatee, is tasked with taking the Assassin Templar War to Rome. After the Borgia family kills Ezio's uncle Mario and reclaims the MacGuffin for the Templars, Ezio works not only to liberate and rebuild the city, but also to restore the Brotherhood Assassin Order. All the while, Desmond and the Mystery Gang are trying to stop the 2012 apocalypse. Sadly, not that 2012. This 2012 disaster was a recurrence of the Toba catastrophe that almost destroyed the Isu, the race of highly advanced humans who had superpowers and were seen as gods, but were defeated by the human rebellion and oh, screw this. Can we please go back to the funny, sexy Italian man? While the game featured a few changes and upgrades to combat, the biggest addition was the Brotherhood system. Throughout the game, players could recruit new assassins to the Brotherhood and send them on missions or use them as support during Ezio's missions in combat. However, the system wasn't without cost, both in skill points and the fact that your recruited assassins could die. Brotherhood would also be the first Assassin's Creed game to include a multiplayer mode, a feature the Ubisoft teams have been wanting to add to the Assassin's Creed series since its 2007 release. Players took the role of training Templars and could choose from different game modes across several maps from both Brotherhood and Assassin's Creed 2. Ubisoft's open world stealth series was on the up and up. High praise was allotted to Brotherhood. Its improvements, additions, and multiplayer impressed players and journalists everywhere. Three years of releases and revisions led them here. So what came next? Just as Taco Bell debuted Doritos flavored taco shells, Ubisoft would debut the final chapter in the Ezio trilogy, Assassin's Creed Revelations. The game followed an older, and according to Emily, Dilfir Ezio and his journey in Constantinople to unlock the vault built by none other than Altair. The game alternated control between Ezio and Altair, expanding both of their stories and connecting the assassins even further than just being distant relatives. For the most part, gameplay remained the same, minus the addition of the hook blade, and continued to emphasize countering in combos, even at Ezio's old age. And of course, Desmond is here, featuring the thrilling gameplay element of blocky path building. Oh, oh. Revelations also introduced a tower defense minigame called Den Defense to recapture areas of Constantinople and also brought back the recruitment system from Brotherhood as well. Revelations didn't change the formula much, but it was a celebration of the series as a whole, ending one unforgettable chapter and turning the page of a brand new one. Assassin's Creed 3 would take a 200-year leap into the future and leave the familiarity of Europe and the Middle East for the frontiers of the colonial United States. The game introduced two new protagonists in Desmond's ancestral assassin line, Haytham Kenway, a British Templar, and Connor, his assassin's son, and you thought you had daddy issues. Similar to Ezio, an attack on Connor's mother and tribe leads him to train under former assassin Achilles Davenport, and he later lends his new skills to the Revolutionary War. Throughout the game, you are able to participate in significant historical events, like the Boston Tea Party, and doing the ride of Paul Revere because apparently he was a lazy little shit. This way, Connor! To the left, Connor! Turn right! Excellent! We are right on course! Assassin's Creed 3 not only allowed you to explore the cities, ports, and wilderness of a 1700s North America, but it also introduced a feature that would eventually become a cornerstone of the series, naval gameplay. While it was not a large part of the game, privateer missions provided a refreshing break from the standard parkour, stealth, and combat that the series focused on. Ubisoft Singapore, who had assisted with previous Assassin's Creed titles, was the lead development team on the naval combat in Assassin's Creed 3. The Singapore studio's work would ultimately set them on the path of creating a game that has taken longer to release than a George R. R. Martin book, Skull and Bones. Assassin's Creed 3 also expanded its world by introducing hunting, homestead management, a new assassin recruitment system, and oh yeah, guns. I mean, it wouldn't be a truly accurate American experience without unregulated firearms, would it? The Desmond sections of Assassin's Creed 3 are concise, thank the Isu, culminating in the end of his story. An online multiplayer returned with familiar modes and the entertaining co-op Wolfpack mode. 
Now, while the characters were sadly not as memorable and the game featured some inconsistent pacing, it was still a solid entry in the series. The struggle of Connor's allegiance to his father, his tribe, and the assassins was an interesting one to say the least. Look, it had a hard and impressive act to follow and was very much a fine game. Trust me, the actual rough ones would be coming down the line. Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation was another spin-off release for the PS Vita, alongside Assassin's Creed 3 in October of 2012. While 3 focused on the Northeastern colonies, Liberation brought players to French Louisiana and introduced the first female protagonist in the series, Assassin Aveline de Grand Pre, which was fantastic if you had access to a PS Vita, which not every Assassin's Creed fan did. What Liberation did well was deliver a fun and engaging portable open world. The gameplay felt fluid and as good as its predecessors. However, the game's plot threads were fairly shallow, which is a bummer for such a unique assassin character in a unique location. But the one addition to the game that made Liberation memorable was the disguise, aka the Persona ability. Get that out of here! Aveline has three different personas, the assassin, the lady, and the slave. Each persona not only changed her appearance and gear, but affected her skills, accessibility to areas, and how NPCs would react to her. As creative as these options were, unfortunately, certain missions tended to force your hand, not allowing you to creatively pick which persona you wanted to use for that situation. Eventually, Liberation was released across consoles and PC thanks to the HD and remastered versions of the title, so fans everywhere could eventually dive into Aveline's adventures into the Gulf. And as Ubisoft continued to expand the series, Assassin's Creed 3 and Liberation would pave the way for one of the most beloved games games yet. 2013's Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag took the naval gameplay introduced in 3 and improved it tenfold. Ubisoft Montreal took the helm of the tech that Singapore had developed and made it the center of the game. Continuing the Kenway line, Black Flag introduced Edward Kenway, Haytham's father and Connor's grandfather a pirate assassin and privateer that made his home in the Caribbean. The narrative was lighter than its predecessors, focusing more on the golden age of piracy rather than the world ending in MacGuffin searching assassins and Templars. With its sailing, diving, and island hopping exploration, Black Flag took the Assassin's Creed series in a more immersive open world direction. Honestly, the best part of the game was not the story, but the ability to free roam and create your own pirate adventure. Would you stick to hunting marine life or search for treasure in various tombs? And for once, the modern day segments were fun. I know, I was just as surprised as you are. The transition into first person gave the interactions at Abstergo a more personal feel. I'm not trying to pay attention to two different yet simultaneous character-driven stories, but rather Edward's story and then uncovering Abstergo secrets and lore for myself. Black Flag looked great, felt great, hell, I bet if we had the technology, it would even smell great, like rum, sweat in the open sea. It easily became one of the best-selling games of 2013 and revitalized the love and dedication for the series. Knowing that they had a gold mine, or rather a gold-filled chest on their hands, Ubisoft Montreal continued to give the people what they clearly wanted, more pirate assassin adventures. Enter Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry. Originally packaged as DLC for Black Flag, Freedom Cry would later be released as a standalone game that did not require Black Flag in 2014. Now, I know we've mostly been focusing on the actual games rather than every single piece of DLC, but Freedom Cry was crucial to mention since it eventually became a standalone special case. The story centered around Adewale. Edward's quartermaster in Black Flag and a former slave from Trinidad, where Black Flag's tone was lighter, Freedom Cry poignantly focused on slavery, freedom, and ultimately revolution. Since it was originally DLC, Freedom Cry ironically does not present the same freedoms as Black Flag. There is limited exploration and you are mostly on the rails of this story, but overall it was still a compelling release and the writers even received a Writers Guild of America nomination for the story. Black Flag had set the bar so high for the series that it would become difficult for future games to measure up. Which of course leads us to the infamous release of 2014's Assassin's Creed Unity.
Unity takes place in Paris during the French Revolution and centers around assassin Arnaud Dorian, his star-crossed lover Elise, and his mission to avenge his adopted father's murder, all whilst the people of Paris sing the song of angry men, just without Russell Crowe's Javert. And I'm Javert! Unfortunately, the bugs and glitches upon release made the game lackluster for some and utterly unplayable for others. One that became infamous was the No Face bug, which affected PC users with particular graphics card. You'd think that a company based in France would make sure that their game set in France would be the best in the series. Now, it'd be easy to sit here and continue to shit on this game, but there were some things that Unity did well, creative control being one of them. Not only did the game allow you to customize gear, skills, consumables, and boosts with the use of creed points, but the additional creative options as to how you would handle large missions was refreshing, even if the cover system was a bit broken at times. Unity also introduced co-op multiplayer, which allowed up to four players to engage in missions and explore Paris together. And it was no easy feat. If one of you went down, the whole team would go down, coinciding in a failed mission. And its recreation of 18th century France is an absolute marvel. But like a lot of rough releases over the years, Unity has gotten a second life and better reception thanks to players revisiting the game now that it's no longer a buggy mess. <laughs> Assassin's Creed Rogue, which was released for the previous generation of consoles at the same time as Unity, didn't do anything to further the series either. Hell, most of the X-Play team forgot that game even came out. Just like how everyone forgot about that Chun-Li Street Fighter spin-off movie that actually released in 2009 and actually got a 3% on Rotten Tomatoes, Rogue presented players with the unique story of Irish assassin Shea Patrick Cormac turned Templar. There really wasn't anything too rewarding about that transition, which was the writer's intention. Although the Templars had been painted as pretty ruthless throughout the series, it wasn't about Shay going to the dark side, but rather him realizing his ideals and methods align more with that of the Templars, creating a complex story that would challenge its players, those that actually played it anyways. But Rogue did manage to creatively unite Black Flag, Assassin's Creed 3, and Unity, both in gameplay and in narrative. So you could basically call this game Assassin's Creed The Seven Degrees of Shade Patrick. But sadly, Unity's rough release took the spotlight and forced Rogue to fade into obscurity. The ninth major installment and last classic Assassin's Creed game would be 2015's Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Syndicate transported players to London during the Industrial Revolution and blended the Brotherhood with organized crime. The title centered around twins Jacob and Evie Fry. Jacob was the charismatic and brash fighter, while Evie was the brilliant mastermind and stealthier of the two. Despite them being twins, the game did tend to lean harder towards Jacob during main assassination missions, which is one of the many criticisms. And this, sadly, was a pattern for many Assassin's Creed games. Just as we mentioned earlier, Liberation, the first game to feature a female assassin, was limited to those with access to a PS Vita. Female assassins were not an available option in Unity's co-op multiplayer due to their models being, quote, too difficult to animate. Later, in both Origins and Odyssey, the female characters of Aya and Cassandra were both initially meant to be leads of their own games, but their leading roles were scrapped on the grounds that, quote, games with female leads don't sell. But back to the piss-stained, smoke-stacked streets of London. Throughout the game, you would align with various gangs and lead fights against other gangs, which was a hint at the massive Spartan battles in the series' future. Syndicate granted its players creative and fun weapons choices, zip lines between buildings, carriages that could be ridden in or driven, and more. There is no multiplayer with no major advancements to its traditional stealth and combat. It was a good addition to the franchise, but did not stand out the way the team had hoped. Sadly, despite it being a great game with fantastic DLC, Syndicate undersold, so Ubisoft halted the Assassin's Creed factory and decided to reevaluate and reinvigorate the series. So, what would Ubisoft do in the meantime? Release a bunch of side titles and mobile games, of course. Throughout 2015 and 2016, Ubisoft published three side-scroller 2.5D platformer titles under the Chronicles series moniker, China, India, and Russia. Each title featured a different art style and assassin from across the Assassin's Creed expanded universe. While the games were simple and fun, they were just that, simple. 
repetitive for some and even challenging for others. They offered a quick fix for Assassin's Creed fans, but simply couldn't replace the main game-shaped hole in many players' hearts. And of course, there are a slew of mobile games and spin-offs. We mentioned Altair's Chronicles, Bloodlines, and Discovery earlier, which eventually were ported for mobile devices. But we said we're covering every Assassin's Creed game, so here comes the rapid-fire mobile round. First category, Gameloft Main Series Mobile Titles. Assassin's Creed Mobile, great. Assassin's Creed 2 Mobile, great. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood Mobile, great. Do you notice a trend here? Assassin's Creed Revelations Mobile, great. Assassin's Creed 3 Mobile, great. All of these games were pretty much the same colorful pixel platformer ports of their main game siblings. And speaking of 2D platformers, Assassin's Creed Unity Arnos Chronicles, it's basic, like a more boring version of Discovery. Bad. And it was only available on Honor mobile devices? Next are the card games. 2011's Assassin's Creed Recollection, a real-time strategy card game that was full of detail and well-designed gameplay. Great! 2015's Assassin's Creed Memories. It came packed with slow 3D quick-time action animations, sudden side-scrolling sequences, marketing PNGs of characters talking, and unrewarding card-based gameplay. Bad. And then we have the grab -all. Assassin's Creed Pirates, a game that blends the 3D sailing gameplay from Black Flag with 2D visual novel narrative elements. Just okay. Assassin's Creed Identity, a full 3D action-adventure mobile game set in the world of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. A return to the classics. Mm, just okay. The Tower Assassin's Creed, you just stack the tower as high as you can for your assassin to climb. Pretty art style, though, and just okay. Assassin's Creed Free Runners, a mobile free-running platform game where you either compete against other players or yourself with cute versions of the deadly and dead parent assassins. Just okay. AC Rebellion, pretty great. It is a goofy little gotcha game based around the Spanish Brotherhood, but allows you to collect the new and familiar assassins characters from across all the games. And who is the main character? None other than Aguilar de Nerja, from the 2016 Assassin's Creed film. So yeah, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Magneto 2.0 Assassin is now officially in the Ubisoft video game canon. Oh, and speaking of digital adventures, who could forget the Twitter assassination experience? Yes, this was a real thing, sponsored by Verizon, which was basically Assassin's Creed Twitter LARP, where you just spammed attacks at other Twitter users and could go into aggro mode on multiple digital asses. But for real, if you remember this activation or even participated in it, please let us know in the comments below. Also, Ubisoft, bring back the Twitter assassination experience, please. So during the two years after Syndicate's release, Ubisoft had been hard at work revamping the series. And finally, we got to see the culmination of their work in 2017's Assassin's Creed Origins. Origins centers around Bayek, Aya, Cleopatra, and the forming of the Hidden Ones all the way back in ancient Egypt. I got to play this game at E3, and I remember being floored by it. Missions were no longer stuck to specific times of day. The open world had become more full and flavorful. Combat had been completely revamped, and oh yeah, you got to use a f eagle to help you with your missions. The game had gone from its action-adventure origins to more of an RPG with creative execution in the palm of your hands. You weren't punished like in earlier games with auto-fail stealth missions. Now you had creative control and a ton of new tools at your disposal. Assassin's Creed Origins provided a fresh new take on the franchise, much like 1999's The Mummy did for Mummies Everywhere. And Daddies. And Emily's. Now that the Assassin's Creed factory was up and running at full speed once again, after Origins, it was time to deliver their next game, and fast. 2018's Assassin's Creed Odyssey continued to build on the new groundwork that Origins had set up, and introduced several new gameplay elements, including conquest battles, a bounty system, and sex! You heard that right! For the first time in an Assassin's Creed game, you had the option and choice to romance and bang several NPCs, young women, young men, Pirate Woman, Doctor Man, Old Lady, Man and Goat, you name it. Oh, 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 uh, don't, don't mind her. She likes to watch. And finally, for the first time in a main Assassin's Creed title, you had the option to play the entire game as a female character. And believe it or not, Cassandra quickly became the favorite choice of a lot of gamers everywhere. Assassin's Creed Odyssey gave players beautiful Grecian landscapes, compelling gameplay, and of course, a story to mirror Homer's Odyssey itself. Literally, that's why it's called Odyssey. You fight a dude called the Cyclops in one of the earlier missions. It's smart, 
and fun. But one of the downsides to Odyssey was its microtransactions. While microtransactions weren't new to the Assassin's Creed series, some players started to be annoyed by them in Origins, and especially in Odyssey. You could either spend hours grinding and collecting materials in-game to level up, or just purchase them and level up instantly. And in a game that is over 100 plus hours long, if you finish and find every quest and collectible, that's a lot of additional time hunting for materials versus the super convenient menu screen that is also conveniently attached to your credit card. Which would continue to be a trend into the next and latest Assassin's Creed game, 2020's Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Valhalla put players in the fur-lined assassin boots of Eivor, a Viking helping their people settle, align, and subsequently raid the British Isles. Along with settlement building and epic raids, the game came jam-packed with multiple maps, including one in literal Valhalla, psychedelic challenges, and oh yeah, flighting duels, which are just old European roast battles. Brutal, I adore it. And of course, romance options were back and in full 9th century swing. Which, fun fact, Assassin's Creed Valhalla had more romance options at release than Cyberpunk 2077, which came out only a few months later. Only two willing to spread their legs for you. Sad. Oh yeah, and that Valhalla map? Eivor is the reincarnation of Isu Odin, and the Isu also appeared in Odyssey, and in Origins and Ancient Tombs, but the voices are not just talking to Bayek, but also to you the player, and now there's an Aurora Borealis that is trying to kill everyone too, oh yeah, and there's new Desmond, aka Layla Hassan. She's been here the whole time, acting as the vessel through which the modern day story is told. Look, before the next Assassin's Creed game, we will break down and put together the real world and Isu apocalyptic storyline of the Assassin's Creed series once and for all. And speaking of the next game, the future is bright and packed for Assassin's Creed. During the September 2022 Ubisoft Forward event, the X-Play team and Assassin's Creed fans around the globe were given so much Assassin's Creed news. Coming down the pipeline, we've got Codename Jade, the first mobile open world Assassin's Creed game set in ancient China where you can create your own assassin. Codename Red, the feudal Japan Assassin's Creed game that fans have been waiting years for. And the mysterious and spooky codename Hexe, which from the teaser alone promises potential horror elements for the series. Red, Hexe, multiplayer, and more will be available on the currently in development Infinity Hub that will unite Assassin's Creed experiences and players. And of course, there's 2023's Assassin's Creed Mirage. Mirage is a celebration of all Assassin's Creed titles, with a focus on returning to the series' roots while still utilizing the modern updates and features we've been introduced to over the last five years. The game will feature a more linear narrative like the original titles, but within main missions, you'll have the ability to still get creative. Mirage will come packed with new abilities like a slow time feature, pole vaulting, mines, blow darts, and more. Throughout the game, players will have the chance to explore Baghdad at its height in the 9th century and play as a younger version of Basim, yes, THE Basim from Valhalla, as he evolves from street thief to master assassin. And every assassin needs a mentor. Another key player in Assassin's Creed Mirage is Roshan, Basim's mentor who is also being played by Emmy Award-winning actress Shoray Agdashlu. Overall, Mirage feels like the perfect game to release during the series' 15th anniversary year. It's a nod to the series' diverse past, present, and will become a launch point for the future of Assassin's Creed titles. And with Jade, Red, Hexe, and ultimately the Infinity Hub on the way, the world will not see the end of the Hidden Ones for some time. The Assassin's Creed series is arguably one of the most diverse and evolutionary game series out there. Each new title improved upon the last in some way, or at least attempted to, and there is something so special about stepping into the historical shoes of a stealthy assassin and exploring a well-designed world out of time. There is a reason these games have, for the most part, continued to garner hype over the last 15 years. Everyone has their favorite game, everyone has their favorite setting, and everyone has their favorite assassin. So here's to Assassin's Creed, may Ubisoft continue to improve and evolve this series for years to come, and hopefully someday we'll finally get a movie or streaming series that features Ezio. Hey, I can dream. <laughs>